Um, so hello everyone. Uh, today's uh, speaker for Net seminar is Nate Foster. Uh, Nate is a professor at Col uh, Cornell University. He did his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania and then a postdoc at Princeton. He has done, done great work on language abstractions and things like phonetic uh, on lesbian space. Um, he just was at ONS for the last couple of days and today he's going to give a talk on the recent work that they have in his group. Thanks. So it's really exciting to be here, where you guys did a lot of the work that enabled uh, the work I'm going to talk about today. And thanks especially to Giannis for uh, hosting me and uh, rescuing me from the bowels of Stanford construction to learn from as well. So this is work that um, we've been doing, trying to develop what they call a formal foundation for network programming. Uh, and the ultimate goal is to be able to build the kind of um, precise and automated tools uh, for building network software that we have for ordinary software. Um, I should start by saying that I didn't do this work alone. Uh, we used a, a proof assistant to do it. And actually, uh, there are a bunch of human proof assistants who did, of course, all the real work. Uh, so Arjun Guha, who's here, uh, he's a postdoc in my group, uh, on his way to a faculty position at UMass this summer, uh, is the leader of this project. Uh, Mark Reichblatt, who's a PhD student, uh, also contributed. And an undergraduate work at Gooms has been helping us build uh, some automated tools on top of it. Uh, so, of course, they all the real work. So uh, the motivation for this uh, whole project is really to uh, address some serious issues that, um, that networks have with respect to reliability. Um, so just as kind of puff piece motivation, I thought I'd kind of give a rogues gallery of um, sort of examples of uh, network failures that have happened in the last few years. Um, you can go further and find many more such examples. So um, I assume most of you use GitHub to, to store your code. Uh, and if you happen to be using GitHub just after Thanksgiving last year, when we happened to write this paper, um, GitHub went down uh, for a bunch of accounts for uh, the, the better part of the day. Um, so they had this kind of complete outage. Um, and after the fact, they did a post-mortem and discovered that uh, what had caused the outage was actually a misconfiguration uh, between a pair of switches that caused the loop. So GitHub, you know, they're smart people. They uh, build uh, sort of basic infrastructure for programmers, and uh, they couldn't get sort of a fundamental problem on networks right now. Uh, there was another infamous example in Amazon a little earlier. Uh, they were trying to implement a sort of routine maintenance task, and they made a mistake and shipped a bunch of network, a bunch of network traffic onto a backup network, and this triggered a sequence of cascading failures that eventually took out uh, their whole East Coast data center for a few days. Um, GoDaddy had another issue, a uh, similar kind of um, uh, sort of internal network events that led to corrupted router tables and led to an outage, uh, taking out uh, their DNS service and a bunch of their customer sites. My favorite example, uh, United, uh, it was about two years ago now, had uh, some connectivity issues with the network uh, that uh, caused their flight system to become unavailable and actually led to a full ground stop at SFO. Um, so my favorite example is instead of issuing tickets like this, which is my ticket for today, they were actually handing out uh, tickets that look like this, uh, written by gate agents in pen. So um, we're kind of in this weird situation where networks are really critical infrastructure. Right? We use them for programming, uh, for uh, you know, business through Amazon, uh, DNS, even airlines, and yet we kind of build them using very rudimentary sort of 1960s era software techniques. Uh, for the most part, many networks are actually run by operators going in and manually uh, interacting with the command line interface and uh, programming network that way. And so the result is that they're just not very reliable, and this is pretty crazy. So uh, if you're a, so my training's in programming languages, and if you're a PL person like me, um, when I first started thinking about this, you know, I kind of had a simplistic <coughs> um, sort of a, a bunch of devices that sort of get bits from here to there. Um, and the reason that this problem actually turns out to be fairly complex is that, of course, networks are not so simple. Uh, there's many, many different kinds of devices that are involved, and there's many different languages and programs that are involved in getting bits from here to there. Uh, so just to kind of show a cartoon example, uh, if, you, if you kind of take you know, an interaction between, say, my laptop and a survey on like YouTube, um, there's not just sort of uh, you know, a series of tubes or uh, a bunch of switches between me and YouTube. There's many, many different kinds of devices. So you have like my laptop, a bunch of hosts, maybe connected to a local network by Ethernet switches. You know, on the other side, you know, a bunch of YouTube servers that are serving up the videos. They're connected maybe to some routers sitting behind a load balancer. There's some kind of gateway router that uh, sits between the data center and the rest of the internet. Of course, there's other ISPs. So you have things like PGP. You need firewalls to deal with security. You might have wireless hosts. 
So you need things like wireless gateways and middle boxes and so on. And so, you know, a fairly simple thing like my computer connecting over vanilla IP to YouTube actually has to traverse, you know, many, many different kinds of devices. And each of these devices runs its own program in its own language. And so even checking a very simple property like, you know, I have basic connectivity uh, is, is fairly challenging. You have to reason about all of these programs and all of their interactions together. So uh, you guys here have been developing a new kind of architecture for networks where uh, the kind of in, in the most extreme version, uh, the vision is to, to replace all of these special purpose boxes with very, very simple boxes running uh, a standard, uh, very simple and elegant programming language. And so uh, if you want to think about things like uh, building reliable networks and things like verification, this presents a great opportunity. Because instead of having to analyze and pick apart you know, all of the programs for those many different kinds of devices that I had in the previous slide, you could imagine building tools uh, that um, represent the meaning of the programs written for this standard and simple and canonical device, and then starting to, uh, start to automatically reason about their properties. Um, so I probably don't need this slide for this talk, but uh, for this audience, but I'll include it just the same. So you know, what are software-defined networks? So it's, in my view, sort of the key two ingredients are this idea of generalizing and standardizing data planes, and then separating forwarding from control. So instead of a you know, legacy network like this, where you have uh, many different devices, each running their own program, maybe different programs, uh, instead you have all the programs running on uh, one or more controller machines and interacting with a bunch of stock devices by standard. So there's lots of reasons to like SDN. Uh, the one that I'm going to focus on in this talk is that um, by having a clear and simple specification for what devices are and what programs they run, um, we can start to build tools uh, that capture precisely their semantics, and we can start to reason formally about the behavior of network programs. So just to motivate, I thought I'd start with a very, very simple example. Uh, if you were at Arjun's talk a couple of days ago, you saw uh, the same example. Uh, so here's my network. Uh, it's a little trivial. Uh, but it will exhibit uh, sort of a few features that come up in, in more complicated settings. Uh, there's just one switch. It has four ports, and it's connected to three hosts, uh, one, two, and four for some reason, and uh, a logger uh, that's going to uh, be a middle box sort of monitoring web traffic. And so the policy that I want to uh, implement in this network consists of three high-level components. Uh, there's a security component, so I want to block all SSH traffic. There's a monitoring component, uh, I want all web traffic uh, to be uh, diverted to uh, this middle box, which is going to log them, uh, and maybe I'll do some post hoc analysis after. And then there's sort of a forwarding or routing policy which says I want to provide connectivity between the rest of these hosts. So very, very simple, uh, but I'm going to show you that actually implementing this policy, even using something like uh, SDN or OpenFlow, turns out to be a little bit complicated. So um, let me just skip this slide. I think everyone in the room knows uh, what switches and controllers are? Anyone? No. So um, if you want to actually write uh, a program that uh, implements that policy correctly, and, and by correctly here, I mean I really want to at all times enforce my security policy, at all times uh, enforce my monitoring policy, and uh, provide connectivity in the absence of failures, then, uh, then you really have to deal with a bunch of um, low-level issues uh, in writing your program. So the first is, you know, what I'd like to do is write a program that somehow configures that one switch so it has this forwarding table. Um, you can think through it as I, as I talk. It basically has a sequence of rules. They're in priority order, and they do things like the top rule filters and drops SSH traffic. The middle rules uh, detect web traffic and send them both to their destination to the middle box, and the rest of the rules forward the remaining traffic, which is non-web and non-SSH, uh, to the host. So I'd like to get that switch into this state. And so the first thing you think is, if you're using um, something like uh, POX or NOX, uh, you might write a controller program that looks like this. So uh, here I've defined a handler for the uh, switch join event, so the switch next to the network, the, to the controller, and uh, I get this identifier, and I'm going to send it a sequence of messages uh, that instruct it to install rules corresponding to each of the entries in the previous slide. Uh, so this sounds good, but of course what can happen is while these messages are coming down to the switch, we could have traffic that's traversing the network. And so uh, in an OpenFlow network, these packets that are coming in before the rules have been uh, processed and installed by the switch will get diverted to the controller. And so I actually have to write a second program, which looks pretty similar but not identical, that handles these packets that are diverted to the 
So here I write a different event handler for uh, the so-called packet in event, uh, which receives uh, a, a packet from a particular switch and basically applies uh, the corresponding actions from my policy to that packet. Uh, and does that by uh, explicitly sending out a packet out message. So, um, of course, this creates a problem because we now have sort of two realizations of our program, uh, of our, sorry, of our policy in our controller program, and it's important that these disagree. Um, and you actually might notice here that I, I have a bug. Uh, the packet in uh, fragment here uh, doesn't correctly handle SSH traffic. Uh, and so uh, it will be allowed for, for packets that might arrive uh, while the rules are reinstalled. <coughs> and you might say, well, this is silly. We should you know, never write programs that generate packet ins. But in general, you know, the network's not going to be static. Your policy might be dynamic and change over time. And so you're going to have to deal with um, periods of transition where there's rules coming down and traffic uh, traversing a switch that may or may not uh, match all of those rules. And this leads to a situation where you have replicated functionality. So a second problem that uh, can come up when writing these control programs is that uh, switches are actually free, and many do, uh, to reorder messages. So going back to our first event handler, the switch joining function, um, we sort of enumerated uh, the rules in order uh, from highest priority to lowest priority. And so what we expect is that the switch, when it receives and processes these messages, will basically take us from an empty flow table to one that's fully configured with uh, our flow table. And I've elided the priorities here, but you can read them as going from top to bottom. Um, so we, you know, in our, a naive program in their head would think, well, what's going to happen is, okay, the first message uh, is sent to the switch, it installs a rule, the second message is sent, the third message is sent, and so on. And eventually we get all the way down to the full table. But uh, if you look back carefully, uh, you discover that switches are actually free to reorder messages. So uh, the switch could receive a bunch of the messages, buffer them, and then choose to install these two rules instead. So this rule just says everything coming uh, to host one forwarded out port one, and to host two forward out port two. And so this is a problem uh, if we want to be, uh, you know, actually implement, for example, our security policy. We've now, at least until the rest of the, of the rules are installed, allowed SSH traffic to flow through. Um, and we talked to some friends at Google, and they told us that actually uh, issues with reorderings of messages uh, have caused problems for them in the past. So switches do um, buffer and reorder control messages, and that's installing cheaper messages uh, before installing more expensive messages. Um, so if you want to reason precisely about the forwarding behavior, you, know, you need to deal with uh, this kind of uh, situation. The solution is you know, not that complicated. You basically have to uh, realize that the switch has this asynchrony built in and in insert into your program some explicit synchronization uh, using barriers, uh, which basically say, don't proceed past this message uh, until you've processed all previous messages, and let me know when you've done that. Uh, so in this case, you know, we'd be sure that our policy was at all times enforced, because uh, the rule to drop SSH traffic would be installed before any forward rules were through, and likewise for the monitor rules. So again, uh, sort of not rocket science, and you know, keep in mind this is a baby example, but it's another kind of low-level detail uh, that is easy to get wrong. Uh, and leads to you know, completely opposite behavior. To the other time. So uh, a third issue is that, uh, and this is maybe again sort of just misreading the spec, uh, but uh, if you're not careful, you actually have to, you can end up with patterns that you send in messages that don't mean what you think they do. So here I wrote down patterns for each of my rules that matched on things like uh, destination IP and destination port, um, but actually. Uh, this pattern here, for example, destination port 22, if you write this literal code in POX, it matches all packets. And the reason why is that uh, if you look at the OpenFlow specification, the way that a switch will interpret this kind of message uh, corresponds to this flowchart, uh, which says that uh, basically you need to walk up the packet, right, starting from Ethernet and going up the layers, and you only proceed to higher layers uh, if all of the dependencies at lower layers have been specified. So a pattern like destination port 22 is exactly the same as that pattern not being there because you haven't said that the Ethernet frame type is IP and the um, uh, network type is TCP, network protocol type. Um, so again, you know, not uh, rocket science, and a, and a good programmer is not going to miss this detail, but uh, it's something that's easy to get wrong and that leads to a completely different implementation of uh, your policy. So of course, what you have to do is just write these more complicated patterns that uh, have the property that all of their dependencies uh, are satisfied. So um, 
you know, these are all kind of simple, low-level things. Uh, and for a, a, a program involving one switch, you know, you can imagine that a uh, program might, might get them all right. Uh, but if you're talking about a program that's controlling I mean, hundreds or thousands of switches, or if you're talking about a controller that provides higher level abstractions, uh, like uh, some kind of programming language, and that has a compiler and an optimizer that's actually managing these rules for you, these little issues can cause bugs. And in fact, all of these uh, issues have caused uh, bugs in some of the research controllers that have been uh, proposed by uh, our group and others. Uh, so uh, since they're in the room, so Arjun had a system ping that he developed at Brown uh, that had uh, the first three of these issues. Uh, we've been building a system net core that had the last four, and there's a system out of Yale called Nettle that also had bugs uh, by, uh, by having uh, some of these same issues. So um, that's just to give you a flavor of sort of even for a simple and, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, uh, overly simple uh, specification of switch hardware like OpenFlow 1.0, there are a bunch of these low-level details that I think ordinary programmers are not very good at, at managing. Um, so, uh, to help programmers get these things right, there's sort of a cottage industry in the networking community. Uh, Payman and Nick and George and uh, some other people have been developing tools for checking configurations automatically. Uh, so there's things like Flow Checker, uh, which was done by some people out of the Carolinas in, uh, in 2010. Ant Eater from Brighton Godfrey and Matt Caesar at UIUC. Uh, nice, which was done by people at like EFL. Header Space done here. Veriflow, which is done by the same people as Ant Eater, and others. And the way these tools work is they basically, um, with one exception, nice is a little different. The rest uh, work by basically wrapping a controller with a runtime monitor that inspects the sequence of messages that are going up and down and checks for violations of safety parameters. Um, that's a little bit of a simple uh, explanation. Some of these kind of have a more static component where they actually build up a model of the, of the um, overall network configuration and check properties, but that's the basic idea. So I'm really excited about this. Um, I think it's wonderful that, um, that your community is getting excited about uh, the kinds of tools that usually uh, don't leave uh, the sort of PL uh, ivory tower. Um, and I think that these kind of tools have the potential to have a huge impact. Um, there's a couple of things that I think uh, are uh, a little less good about these tools. Um, one is that um, you know, all of these, uh, the designers of these systems had to work really hard and come up with really clever optimizations to make them scale and run fast. Um, so you know, Payment, for example, um, has used header space to analyze the Stanford campus network and had to come up with some quite clever optimizations. Um, if you just did the sort of naive way of encoding these configurations, it just blow up all over the place and you wouldn't be able to, to run on, on anything of realistic size. Uh, and Veriflow has pushed this uh, pretty further, actually, pretty, uh, much farther, actually, building a tool that they claim can be run sort of online. Um, but finally, they're dynamic tools, and uh, there are uh, sort of uh, you know, fundamental complexity limits that you're going to run up against in any of those decision procedures for checking these kinds of properties. Um, another issue is that um, each of them actually sort of picks a, uh, a custom mathematical foundation. So their, their notion of correctness rests on a model of a switch and a model of a network uh, that is inspired by things like OpenFlow, but um, maybe not as precise as, uh, as the PL community would like. And so um, there, are, there are issues that are sort of not represented in some of these informal models. Uh, for example, some of these tools don't look at barriers at all. And so they just assume that switches will install messages in order. Um, and as we saw, this can lead to the complete opposite behavior that you expected. So uh, what we did in this work was to try to come up with a slightly different approach. Um, and that's to get away from verifying low-level configurations at runtime, and instead have a system that lets us generate configurations that are guaranteed to be correct. So you know, if we've done our job, we won't actually have to check these things because we'll have a, a mathematical proof that uh, all of our configurations, all of our messages, all of our control software um, is uh, correct according to some specification. Um, and we'll be able to do reasoning about the behavior of the network using uh, programs expressed in a much higher level of abstraction. Um, and uh, we'll get a very uh, rigorous proof of correctness by actually showing that the translation from our high level language to these low level uh, switch rules and runtime systems and such um, by uh, carrying out that proof of correctness in uh, a mechanized proof of system. Um, one other piece of, thing of work that we're going to do is actually not uh, prove the correctness against some sort of informal ad hoc model, but actually develop 
a very detailed mathematical model of what open flow networks are. And so all of our theorems will rest upon uh, this very careful uh, sort of transcription of, um, of the open flow standard into mathematical structures. Okay. Um, so um, some of the questions that Arjun got during his ONS talk uh, made me realize that uh, some of sort of what's possible in terms of formal methods research may not be well known by uh, this community. So I thought I'd give one slide that kind of shows um, the kinds of things that people have been doing. Um, there's been this amazing amount of uh, progress in the last few years, and it's now possible to build large, realistic software systems using uh, verified or certified techniques. Um, so a couple of the uh, really high-profile success stories. You've probably heard of the SEL4 operating system. Uh, this was a, a major effort out of Australia, um, actually verifying the behavior of a microkernel against a reference implementation in a mechanical proof assistant. Um, there's another system uh, that I really like that you may not be aware of. It's well, a, that's, uh, that's, you know, what, what language did the kernel is uh, the kernel, I believe, is written in C. It's proved correct against the reference model implemented in Haskell. Oh. Um, so they basically wrote down a very simple model of what the behavior of the kernel should be and then showed a correspondence between the real C code and the Haskell. Um, so another system uh, that's um, uh, in the PL community been quite high profile is the CompSearch C compiler. Um, so this is a project by Xavier Lois, who's the person who invented OCaml, um, and uh, one of the many people who did OCaml. Um, so what CompSert is, is it's a uh, compiler that goes from a large but safe subset of C all the way down to x86. And there's a proof of correctness that all of the executables produced by the compiler um, are uh, correctly realized the uh, semantics of the C program that you started out with. Um, and there's another system out of MSR called fstar that's uh, sort of similar. So, um, you know, formal methods, which kind of in the 60s, 70s, 80s was you know really only applied to kind of really small, um, abstract kinds of systems, has gotten to the point where uh, you're able to actually build things like an operating system or a compiler or your other examples, database systems or a network controller, um, and actually prove their correctness uh, formally and mechanically. Um, the reason this, this kind of progress is impossible is that a lot of the tools that have been around for decades have gotten very mature. So things like ACL2, Isabel Hall, and the Cockproof Assistant um, now have really rich user interfaces, large libraries of theories and theorems, um, and there's just sort of a lot of sort of um, folklore wisdom that uh, is available. And so if you want to try and build a system and prove it correct, um, you don't have to kind of start from the very foundation. You can actually stand on the shoulders of sort of the people that have built libraries and, uh, and, and such for uh, these other systems. In fact, there's even textbooks now. Uh, so I did my PhD at Penn. Uh, we now <coughs> teach our PL course in a proof assistant. Uh, there's a book called Software Foundations. Um, and Adam Chapala at MIT has a book coming out uh, anytime now from MIT Press called Certified Programming Dependent Types. Um, so the kind of techniques that you need to build these kinds of systems are becoming um, sort of uh, pedestrian enough that you can teach them to advanced undergraduates and graduate students. So what does this actually look like when you build these systems? So the basic idea is that you write your code. Um, I'm going to show you kind of snippets of cop code. Um, and this is basically a sort of uh, simple functional language. Um, so you, you just sort of just write your system just like you write it in an ordinary language. You then do a ton of work. Uh, so this box should be like twice as long as that box. Um, you do a ton of work to prove that your code has the property that you want. Um, and then you can actually <coughs> extract the code to um, you know, code in the ordinary language that you can then compile and run. Um, so basically, when you build a system in this style, um, you get uh, a very uh, strong guarantee that the system that you've implemented and proved correct is the one that's, um, that you're actually running. Uh, so some people call this sort of certified program. Okay, so um, I thought I mentioned this. One of the questions that came up in Arjun's talk was sort of asking, what's the limits of this kind of technique? Like, can you you know, add FPGAs, or could you have arbitrary functions? And I just want to be clear, this isn't like we're using some kind of automated theorem prover to do this. We're not using like a SAT solver or a model checker. Um, this is actually a very rich programming language and a very rich uh, sort of logical language. And you can do any kind of proof you want uh, at great effort, uh, but there's kind of not fundamental limits in terms of what you can uh, express anything computerly. So how does the extract code uh, part work? In the sense that, that do you define what the output you want it to be is, et cetera, or not? Yeah, so the, there's a couple of different ways you do extraction. Um, 
Some systems work by actually taking the content of your proofs mm -hmm. and getting a functional program from that in, you know, for Lisp or for OCaml or for Haskell. Um, that's not what we do. Uh, the other thing you do is basically take uh, your program, which was written in the proof system in its, uh, in its logic, um, and extract from, basically do a very simple translation to, say, OCaml, which is what we do. Um, so to say it another way, um, the, the language that you use for a proof system like Coq is um, a, uh, it's called type theory, it's a, a constructive type theory, um, and it, you can both represent computations and also proofs. Um, and you can basically translate the computations into uh, code for other functional languages. There's very simple correspondence. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're the kind of person who's kind of paranoid about where could bugs creep in, um, you should be worried about a couple things. Um, so this translation that goes from the uh, program for the proof of system into a camel is not verified. Um, it's, uh, you, so you have to trust that. And you also have to trust, of course, the compiler that you use to, to compile this code into a binary. Um, the kind of argument that people often make is that, well, you know, this translation is A, very simple, and B, you know, used in lots of different systems, and so um, it's very unlikely that, you know, mm -hmm. a bug in, uh, in your system would sort of manifest in the exact same way in the extraction process. So, uh, you mentioned quite a few research successes, so uh, could you, like, perhaps educate us on uh, some commercial successes of uh, verification and actually proving that your software is correct? Like, why do people use the software? Yeah, so, um, the, the general trend is that, you know, in industry, there'll be some sort of high profile and expensive mistake, like uh, the Intel uh, Pentium bug. And, uh, and then people will start to invest in formal methods because they realize that sort of using ordinary engineering processes to build these kinds of systems is, is not as reliable as they want. Um, so after the Pentium bug, Intel invested in big time in formal methods, mostly things like model checkers and set software, things like that. Um, I know that uh, Xavier Bois, who's built Comcert, uh, works closely with things like the European uh, people, Airbus and the European uh, Space Agency for building the kinds of software that run um, airplanes and things. Um, there are others. But. Okay, so uh, what is uh, our system going to look like? I kind of gave a very 50,000 foot view of it's kind of a high level language that gets translated onto OpenFlow. Let me take you through the compiler phases in a little more detail. Uh, so uh, the idea is we're going to start with a uh, high-level language called NetCore that we've been developing in the Frenetic group for a couple of years. Um, and we're going to build a compiler that goes from uh, the NetCore language down to what we call flow tables. Uh, these are sort of an idealization of uh, global switch state. Uh, and then we're going to optimize those flow tables. And then we're going to take the flow tables and uh, convert them into open flow messages that get sent to the switches using a runtime system or a controller. Um, and then we're going to prove that uh, at the end of the day, the behavior of this system that you actually run, uh, and we're using a mathematical model of open flow we call featherweight open flow, correctly implements the semantics of our language. So I'll, I'll show you these pieces in detail, but uh, think of this just as you know, a standard kind of compiler <coughs> going from your source language down to your machine level. So each level of abstraction, we're going to represent in a proof assistant, in this case, Coq. Uh, so we're actually going to <coughs> define the syntax and semantics of each of these kinds of programs. Each of these arrows that goes between them, um, these will be realized as you know, phases of the compiler, or transformations from one language to another. And we'll build machine check proofs that each of these translations preserve the semantics of the upstairs level when you go down. Um, and then you know, to actually get a controller we can run, we'll extract this to a camel and uh, run it with our Okay, so let me take you through each of these levels. I'll start with uh, NetCore. I assume some of you have seen this, but not all of you. So NetCore is a um, high-level language for programming OpenFlow switches. Um, it's not super high-level. It's not like Java or Haskell or something. Uh, think of it more like sort of the C of OpenFlow. So um, in NetCore, you know, you basically describe the behavior of the network um, declaratively um, using uh, standard kinds of programming features like and and or, and conditionals, and parallel composition, and such. Um, and then a compiler turns these into uh, a flow mod message that sent to the switch. Um, so let me just step you through sort of some of the uh, pieces of the language uh, step by step. Um, the thing to notice is that you're, you're not programming with rules, you're describing the behavior of the network. So 
the first component is we have a, a, a syntactic class we call predicates. And what a predicate does is it lets you uh, describe a set of packets located somewhere in the network. So you can do things like pick off a packet that's parked at a particular switch or at a particular port on that switch. And you can match on header fields like source IP, destination IP. Um, you can also uh, apply transformations to packets. Uh, so these we call policies or programs. So you can do things like forward the packet out of a particular port, modify a header field, or actually query the packet, and this will cause the packet to divert to the controller. Um, and then you can combine things like predicates using you know, or and and negation, and you can compose policies in parallel. So think of this as sort of um, do all of policy one and all of policy two and get the behaviors of both of them. And you can do things like condition uh, a policy on a predicate. So you know, if a packet's parked at a switch on a port, then do P and otherwise do nothing. So there's a bit more to the language, but you know, think of it just as sort of this um, high-level declarative <coughs> language where you kind of specify the forwarding behavior you want um, and, and then let the compiler generate the rules and you want them. So here's going way back to our simple example. Here's how you write it in netcore. We basically just say, uh, if the packet is not SSH, then forward it between all the hosts using the destination IP uh, to determine where to go, and also forward all web traffic to the middle box. So it you know, couldn't be much simpler than that. Uh, just sort of declare to say what behaviors you want, union them together, and then restrict by your security policy. OK, so uh, the first step in kind of building this uh, verified uh, controller is we have to say, what is the meaning of a Netcore program? And so um, what we can do is you know, define in a precise way the semantics of what one of these, uh, what one of these policies means. So uh, the way we do this in our system is we use what's called an operational semantics. Um, so we're basically modeling the behavior of the system as a series of transitions between states. Um, so to do this, we need to identify you know, what are the states of the system and how can it step between states. And so what we do for Netcore is, so if we have a Netcore program P, the state of the system is going to be a bag of packets that are in flight in the network. So. Um, have this big collection of packets that are in the, in the process of being forwarded. Um, and uh, what we'll do is uh, define a little step relation that goes from one bag to another bag. Uh, and I'm using sort of standard bag notation here. This stands for a union of this bag and this bag, and this stands for a singleton containing just this one located packet. And the way you should read this is program P will step the network from a configuration with packet LP and other packets M to a configuration with uh, the union of bag M and bag M prime if when I take my netcore program and view it as a function and I apply it to that packet, I get M prime. So in general, a netcore program can basically uh, take a packet and produce zero or more packets. And all this says is to sort of run the network one step. You just pick out some packet non-terministically from all the packets that are in flight. You supply it to the program. <coughs> see what packets you get, and put them in. So it's a very simple operational uh, sort of description of what the network does. Um, there's lots of things we're not modeling, uh, but if what you care about is things like reachability properties, uh, this is sort of sufficient to, to capture those. Any questions about this? This is kind of standard stuff for the audience, but um, I don't know how familiar people are with operational things. Um, so, uh, the, the point is that this is basically a, a very precise description of, uh, of the A relation, uh, which is you know, what the network does. Okay, so you know, models help by have forwarding behavior. It abstracts away completely from the fact that there are switches and controllers and messages and, and so on. Uh, we can view the behavior just as this kind of step. Uh, and so it enables very simple reasoning about network-wide properties. Okay, so the next step going down is we have to come up with uh, a translation from this netcore language into things that are more like the tables on switches. Uh, so we'll build a compiler that does that. So what is a flow table? Well, it's basically an intermediate representation of network state that uh, is kind of like what RTL uh, does in an ordinary language. Uh, so it's kind of you know one step closer to what switches actually have, but a little bit idealized in that uh, we have sort of the tables for the entire network you know, in one structure, 
And also, we're not going to deal with things like priorities or the fact that tables might be finite and stuff like this step. We'll just have sort of very large tables. Um, so the goal is to basically go from our netcore programs into these tables. Um, once we have a table like this, we can view it as, just like a netcore program, a function on packets, and define its semantics in the exact same way as an operational step, where uh, at each step we know we can pick one packet, you know, plug it, run it through the flow table, get some more packets, and then put them. Okay, so what, how does this compiler actually work? So it basically has to go from programs down to flow table, and does this by basically flattening uh, the program into tables, and it does this using a, an operator we call intersection. So let me just give you a flavor of how it works. Uh, so suppose that we're compiling this program here, just consists of a single policy fragment, IP H1 go to uh, uh, port 1. This will generate this little flow table here, which is one rule that matches on the Ethernet type and then does the corresponding flow thing. We can have another program over here uh, that matches on port 80 and goes uh, port 4. That generates this flow table. And now if we want to take the union of these two things, what we need to do is basically intersect these rules, generating this rule here. And we take the union of their actions, because we, we're doing both actions. And then we concatenate onto that the flow tables themselves. So uh, by defining a kind of intersection operator on flow tables, uh, we can actually implement things like union and such. Okay, so this is kind of the, the key workers for the uh, question. I just understand uh, the capabilities of devices. Like if the device has you know, multiple tables, it may compile it in a different way. No, so right now we're just targeting a global window, so nothing I will talk about. You know, involves multiple tables or type tables or things like that. Um, we'd like to do that in future work, but we've not done it yet. And even if we did, I think the first step would still go to an idealized representation like this. So this is, um, for those of you who are ONS and saw the Nozix talk, this is kind of similar to the level of abstraction that Nozix was proposing. Um, and I think it's a good first step is kind of to go from your uh, structured language to these tables. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure if this is the right point to ask this question. Sure. But, uh, what is the expressibility of the netcode language? I mean, it seems like it seems fairly restricted in terms of what I can express, what, in terms of the behavior I want from the network. Um, uh, can you give me an example? I mean, yeah, yeah, it's definitely okay, limited, yeah, right? yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, let's say I want to implement a load balancer. So I want some fraction of packets to go to go out of one port for the same match. Some fra I want some fraction to go out of one port and some fraction out of the other port. Can can I express something like that? Um, or or le let's say I want some behavior based on the time of the day. Um, so so if, if it's past 10 so p.m., the, I want uh, an instantaneous sort of snapshot of the load balancer status. We can represent it in netcore, and it's not hard to actually show that you know open flow window flow tables can all be represented in netcore. Okay. Kind of backwards. Mm -hmm. um, what we don't do is things that are stateful and dynamic. So your time of day thing, you, know, you can't represent in netcore. Okay. Um, what we do in our controller is we put all of the dynamism in a program that sits above netcore mm -hmm. that generates netcore policies. Okay. And okay. The interface to this higher level is. I had that query thing in when I showed you the network language. What query does is it uh, basically reads network state and constructs channels that it feeds that state up to the higher level program. So, so the higher level program can do whatever it wants. It can look at clocks, it can do random numbers, it can talk to a you know, Kerberos server, and it can generate then a stream of network policies which capture instantaneous snapshots of a network configuration. So, so network policies are not what I write as, as a programmer. As a programmer, you write, um, in, in our current system, you write uh, a high-level program in, say, OCaml. That's just a general-purpose program that reads on these channels and emits netcore policies. Right. Um, and then, you that, you write netcore policies. Okay. Um, this is a design choice. We could add other features to netcore that are stateful and uh, dynamic. And we've actually played with that in the past. Um, because we are interested in kind of this very precise kind of reasoning, uh, it actually seems, in my opinion, nicer to kind of split the dynamism into a higher level thing. OK. So, um, I'm going to speed up a little bit since I have about five minutes, I think. Um, so um, the, the first theorem that we have to prove in building this verified stack is that our compiler is correct. Um, and so um, there's one issue that you have to deal with right away, which is that the naive compilation algorithm my kind of sketch for you actually has a horrible blow up. It's, complete, it's exponential, and we, just, we ran on a policy with, I think, nine clauses, and like we had to kill it because it was running for so long. Um, and so what you need to do is actually build in an optimizer that uh, takes the flow tables and simplifies them at every step. Um, so we have a, an optimizer, a verified stack, that actually removes uh, empty and shadowed rules. 
And if you throw this in, it turns out that the complexity reduces and you actually get something wrong. So at the end of the day, uh, the correctness theorem for our compiler, which we've uh, formalized in Kafka and proved, uh, is right here. And it basically says, uh, for all uh, optimizers that preserve semantics, so we proved all optimizers that preserve semantics, if you evaluate a uh, policy against a particular uh, packet part to the switch and port with a particular buffer ID, that's equal to evaluating it against a flow table obtained by compiling that policy. So this basically says the compiler produces an equivalent flow table uh, after optimization. So uh, to prove this, uh, Arjun did a ton of work um, so that the actual top level proof kind of falls out as only a few hundred lines, doing things like developing a library of algebraic properties of flow tables. Um, and adding some new automation to COP for doing things like uh, proving equalities between bags. Um, and uh, in addition, there was sort of a key invariant uh, related to that, that second bug that I showed you, uh, which is that all of the patterns that are generated by the compiler, all of the matches, need to satisfy all the dependencies. So just to give you a flavor of what this looks like, this is sort of an invariant that the compiler has to maintain at every step. And it basically just says, you know, if you're matching on things like TCP fields, then you better have specified the protocol's TCP and the Ethernet frame type is IP. And so this is a big uh, type in the Kopf proof system uh, that captures that condition precisely. And uh, you know, part of proving the compiler correct is showing that this property holds uh, at every step of compilation. Okay, so next we need to go all the way down uh, to actual OpenFlow messages. And so to do that, we need some model of what OpenFlow is. And uh, if you, you know, start by looking at the spec, well, there's, you know, even for OpenFlow 1.0, which is very simple, it's a very long spec, and it's not really a mathematical object you can prove something about. It. What it is is a bunch of very carefully written English uh, sentences, um, some diagrams and flowcharts that capture the key part of the system, and, uh, and C structure definitions for the messages. So it's a very, you know, actual nice specification, um, and, you know, it's, you can read it, uh, nice bedtime reading. Um, but it's not something you can really prove a theorem about. So what we did is to take that specification and extract from it a model, uh, which is a precise you know, mathematical object that you can prove something about, uh, which we call featherweight. Um, so the idea here was not to try to capture all of the gory bits of the specification, but just to pull out um, a relatively small uh, extract from it uh, that captures everything related to packet forwarding and it elides other details. So uh, this is what the model looks like. Here's the syntax. It's too small to read, but it's intentional. But there's sort of, um, you know, the model has elements for things like controllers and links and switches and packets. And those are specified as uh, types here. And then it has uh, a bunch of operational rules that are like the uh, judgment that I showed you for how Netcore programs uh, step. In this case, the, things are, the, the steps are much more complicated because they're things like controllers sending messages down to switches, switches pulling messages off of wires, putting them into their buffers, switches reordering their buffers, and then pulling messages out and installing them in the flow tables, and all of that. So this kind of captures all of those behaviors that are specified informally uh, in the spec. So the key things we did when designing this model was you know, we wanted to make sure that the theorems we proved accurately reflected or adequately reflected uh, the forwarding behavior of real networks. So we made sure that we didn't elide any details that were related to packet forwarding. And in particular, we reflected all of the essential asynchrony uh, in our model. So we didn't you know, impose order where uh, there might not be any in the real world. Uh, and we also didn't want to bake in just the network control. We wanted to come up with a framework that you can instantiate with other controllers. Uh, and so in our, in our model, there's sort of a very abstract way of having controllers. So let me just show you <coughs> sort of highlights of this model. Uh, so we kind of go from you know, C structs in the spec uh, to cock data types for representing things like forwarding. We go from flowcharts like this that I showed you into code uh, that captures exactly uh, how pattern matching works. Uh, and so, you know, at the end of the day, Arjun and Mark basically did a ton of work uh, to uh, take these elements of the spec and turn them into uh, types and formulas in uh, Cox logic that exactly capture uh, all the features related to pack packet matching, forwarding, flow table updates, and such. Um, so we also, you know, dealt with all asynchrony. Uh, so things like these informal sentences in the spec turn into structures in conch with bags, and bags represent things that you know, don't have an order. Um, we also uh, abstracted out you know, the specific controller in our system 
so that uh, we're not just proving theorems at the end of the day about, about netcore, but we can actually prove theorems about arbitrary controllers. Um, the way we did this was basically to have a mathematical definition with, uh, you know, the controller kind of has abstract state and a couple of steps for how it uh, consumes and produces messages. A quick question about the bag. Uh, do you assume that the bags are of finite size? Uh, like the back end only hold like a finite number of messages? That's because a good question for Arjun. I think we can answer that question. Uh, yeah, but bags hold some finite number of messages. Uh, like, for example, does it Oh, you, you mean are they, are they bounded? Is yeah, are they bounded, yeah. Uh, no, so out here, we're, out here these bags are unbounded. Uh, so you essentially prove that regardless of all possible message offerings that I can have, if I have, let's say, a million messages, I can have like, order, a million factors, possible objects, right? Your program is right, given all the objects. Uh, let me answer something slightly different. So what, what, we, what we don't account for is uh, packet loss due to buffers, of, buffers overflowing. No, I'm not asking about that. Okay. I'm just curious, like, is the theorem prover actually proving that given all possible offerings of, let's say, a million messages, Yes. Uh, yes. And, absolutely. And, and there's a good tool for doing that. It's called induction, right? So you know that right. the bag is finite but unbounded, and so you consider an arbitrary element. And then okay. okay. So the controller model is very abstract, and so um, to actually uh, prove this theorem that the runtime system correctly implements flow tables, um, we again wanted to do this in a kind of general way. So we wanted to be able to handle things like a naive controller that maybe doesn't install any rules. A so-called reactive controller that works like Ethan did, just installing rules and reaction traffic it sees, and also proactive controllers that compile and install flow tables before they see traffic. Um, and so we came up with a general framework for doing this. Um, this is slightly technical, but the, the theorem that we actually showed, the equivalence, is what's known as uh, a bisimulation, and more precisely a weak bisimulation. And what this says is every step that the controller takes uh, in the high-level abstract model, like Netcore. Uh, there is a corresponding sequence of steps at the open flow level that uh, produce the same observable behavior and vice versa. So this is kind of in um, things like process calculus and concurrency theory, this is kind of the canonical notion of uh, equivalence for non-deterministic concurrent systems. And so uh, here's the kind of snippet of the main theorem in Koch. Uh, it's you know, highly cleaned up, but it basically says we have a weak by simulation between the concrete and abstract systems. Um, the key ingredients for doing this are actually uh, we did this in a very general way, showing that as long as your controller has a couple of natural properties, a safety property, a liveness property, uh, saying that at all times it correctly approximates your high level program, then we can prove this theorem for you automatically. So the takeaway point, uh, kind of talking quickly, but the takeaway point is, you know, we didn't prove a specific theorem for netcore. We came up with a general technique for proving controller correctness. And to use this, you only have to prove a couple of natural properties of your controller, and you get this theorem uh, sort of for free. So uh, very quickly, and I'm running short on time, uh, we've actually uh, you know, compiled and run this thing. So it's a, it's a real system. It's about 12,000 or maybe 15,000 lines of cock. There's about 1,600 lines of blue code no camel. Um, and it consists of all of the levels of abstraction I talked about. Uh, and then we extract it, compile it, and run it. Uh, and we've been using it both uh, on production traffic in our lab, uh, and Arjun's using it in his house. So here's some pictures of the things we've been running it on. We have a pronto switch we're using it on the lab, and Urshan has a cheap Wi-Fi box uh, in his house he's been using it for. And we've been uh, running it on uh, a bunch of sort of simple canonical applications like host discovery and shortest path routing and broadcast and such. Um, we wanted to see that uh, you know, building our controller using these verified tools wasn't going to cause performance to completely suck. And so we did a couple of uh, very simple micro benchmarks. This isn't any kind of comprehensive performance evaluation. We haven't optimized its, its performance at all. So don't take too much away from this, but uh, it's kind of usable for you know, lab settings. So the first experiment we did was just to run Cbench and see uh, you know, how fast our controller could respond to messages. And as you can see, it's basically sort of you know, faster than other prototypes that are not uh, designed for performance, but uh, much slower than things like Knox, uh, which uses C++, and even our previous unverified macro controller in Haskell. And the reason is, uh, basically, we don't have multi-core support, and uh, we have a little bit of latency for the glue code going between COF and, uh, and OCaml. Um, so we expect this to get better as we start to optimize some of this code. Uh, but it's you know, not so slow that it's unuseful. Um, we also did a very simple experiment just to look at uh, what does the control traffic look over, like over time. Uh, so this is, again, just a micro benchmark, but uh, we took a simple Waxman graph with six nodes, two hosts per switch, and we built an application that both broadcasts along a spanning tree and does point-to-point -point forwarding uh, between each of the hosts and generate a bunch of pings. 
uh, to uh, a broadcast address. So basically the traffic is, you know, one host will ping the broadcast address and then receive replies from everyone else. Um, and here are some time series showing the control traffic for a bunch of different controllers. So this is our verified controller. As you can see, it starts with a big spike of traffic uh, as, it, uh, as it installs all the rules for all the flow tables. And then after that, there's basically no traffic. These are just the echo requests that are part of the Keep Alive uh, part of the Open protocol. And this is exactly the same as our unverified controller, uh, uh, more or less, uh, which was written in Haskell. Um, so this is, again, these are time series with uh, sort of the experiment duration on the x-axis and the amount of control traffic in the log scale on the y-axis. Uh, just for fun, we compared with a completely naive controller, one that does all processing on the controller. And here you can see that uh, when you get the broadcast, there's a spike of traffic and then uh, just all the rest of the traffic uh, going through the controller. So it's just a ton. And here's a Ethane-style microflow controller that only installs exact match rules. And so you can see when there's a new traffic flow, you get the spike and then nothing for the responses. So the takeaway is basically, you know, we haven't somehow fundamentally changed the behavior of our compiler by doing this in uh, COG. Its performance with respect to proactive compilation is competitive. Um, I'll just mention this in 10 seconds. Uh, we've also built a tool for automatically verifying Nelcore programs. This is sort of analogous to Payment's header space uh, tool. It uses the same kind of reachability encoding, and we use the three as a backend solver. So to sum up, uh, networks are you know, important infrastructure that we still build using kind of 1960s, 1970s era techniques. Um, I think SDNs are exciting because they provide you know, a very clean uh, foundation that you could imagine building a mathematical foundation on top of and using this to build verified, certified, uh, and so on tools. Um, and as a, I guess Pim did the first step, so as a second step in this direction, we've been uh, building a machine verified controller using the current proof assistant and exploring verified compilation of language like Backdoor. Um, kind of out of time, so let me say we've been doing a lot of other work in Frenetic. Um, the one piece of work I'm going to point out is we had a SIGCOM paper last year on how you can handle updates. And so you might worry that as uh, Nikhil asked, you know, our, our netcore is very static. So um, if, you're, if you have a dynamic program, you know, what kind of guarantees do you get? And uh, the main theorem in this paper showed that if you implement the transition between netcore programs using so-called consistent updates, then the properties of, that, that are common to both programs are preserved across the update. Uh, so if you kind of stitch the theorems in this paper and this paper together, you can actually get guarantees about dynamic networks as well. Um, lastly, um, so this is part of the Phonetic Project, which is joint work with Princeton. And lastly, just one advertisement. Um, so if you are interested in kind of this formal verification approach to networks, come to Cornell. It's like Palo Alto is. Uh, in, by, by June, it'll be like the weather is here. <laughs> we have a great uh, group of lecturers who are lecturing on uh, topics related to formal verification networks. So uh, in particular, Payment and Nick will be coming and talking about header space, but uh, lots of other people as well. OK, thank you for your time. I'll take any questions. So when I think of what controllers do, one of the most fundamental things is topology discovery. And is that handled by your, your runtime system? Yeah, so the, the compiler is basically compiling flow tables for a particular switch, so it knows which switches there are before it compiles. Uh, that's, yeah, that's in the uh, How is the network map that SDN tends to provide the programmers exposed up, I guess, is more my question. So how um, do I know my, where my links are and then build on that? So the, the theorem I feel that like the focus is given a policy, how do I compile it, but I'm kind of missing the bottom. So, so the compiler needs to know which switches there are, right, to compile their flow tables. So all of our theorems are proven with respect to a particular set of switches that are in the okay. network. And the runtime you know, gather, gathers up that set of switches by consuming the switch up events and building up a data structure. OK, so I can think of it as maybe a microcontroller whose pure purpose is to understand link connectivity. But so a netcore policy is defined on switches, but if I don't know what those switches are at first, so there, there has to be so, a flow of information right. up. I'm really so, trying to understand that. The, right, the more refined way which are you need to know what switches there are to compile their rules. So that part is baked into the runtime. If you want to know about link discovery, then you should implement, like every controller does, you know, an LDP like protocol for discovering which switches are connected to each other. And that program you can write in. Netcore, the, the real netcore, which is a slight extension of what I showed you today. Um, so real netcore includes the ability to, for example, push packets into the network and query them out. And so you can use that to implement knocks or boxes or 
a standard controller's notion of distilled. Are the differences between real net core and verified net core largely things that you don't have the, the tools to prove yet, or the time to prove? I wonder, I'm trying to understand the delta and the reasons for it. Um, so it's, uh, th th there are certain things we haven't had the time to prove. So it's particularly to, um, to have a verified uh, topology discovery module, mm -hmm. um, we would need to extend the, the, the verified part of the controller to include uh, you know, ex sort of general synthesized packet out messages, which is what you need to do to build an LDB like protocol. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we haven't proven yet, but, it, but it's something you can do with network, right? except that the theorem doesn't hold for that uh, particular application. So to make, our actual system is structured as a part that's been verified, some unverified parts, and we've also laid on top of that some additional unverified parts to handle things like injecting packets that have not been proven correct at all. And we can prove them correct also, but that would be a ton of work. And uh, you know, the kind of academic contribution this paper is uh, we want to kind of separate from uh, the system that we're building uh, because this is like 10x or more slowdown develop machine check groups of every single function for it. As a developer, developer productivity so that, yeah. And I have one other question if, if anyone else wants to. Okay, so you mentioned COC code is running at runtime. Did I hear that correctly? Uh, extracted COC code, so COC extracted, translated okay. to a camel. And that's part of the reason it's a little slower, that the code is coming from a higher higher level? So, so there's two reasons it's a little slower. So one is, uh, OCaml actually doesn't have great support for multi-core. So our Haskell controller, which has great support for multi-core, was doing the standard thing of having a thread for every switch. Okay. And so for benchmarks like CBench, you know, that thread could basically process messages uh, much faster than just having a single thread. Um, so we don't have that in OCaml. That's one reason. And the second reason is we have our cock code, which extracts to OCaml. And then there's sort of the glue code that's unverified, that goes between you know, binary wire formats and data types that were extracted from COC. And so there's some extra translations that happen um, that are you know, really compositions of, of two functions. And you have to basically take bits off the wire, apply this glue code, put it into COC, back out of COC, back onto the wire. So there's this extra glue code that um, inputs, you know, adds latency to every single message. Okay, so that definitely answers my question. There's no code that you run once. It's every time a net core policy gets defined, you're generating the correct outputs and the, your method to, to verify the correctness of translating the net core inputs to flow tables and everything below uh, is using COC to do that. So it's using it at runtime. The compiler, yeah. the optimizer, the runtime system, those are all written in COC. They then get extracted to a camel and linked again to much other code. And at the linking boundary, we just basically haven't been smart or haven't you know, done it in the most optimized way to basically make it as fast as possible. Um, and so there's extra shim code that gets executed on every single open flow event uh, that you wouldn't have in things like. So the Haskell code, for example, had hand optimized parsers and things that uh, did smarter things. Yeah. Just haven't done yeah. How much is be? that from? How much that uh, code from? We haven't quantified that directly, but. Um, can see from this benchmark. So this was our previous controller, and you know we're factor three slower. Um, I, I expect we should be able to make this much better. We've literally done no profiling, and it's just we just wanted to show that you, know, you can run the thing. This is the rate, not the behavior. Yeah, we haven't quantified the limits. So uh, the other question is, I guess, uh, how does it? I mean, do you have plan to kind of integrate that with branded as an actor? Yeah, so we've actually kind of jettisoned our, our Haskell implementation for the moment and uh, at least turning into Yeah, we're using OCaml and, and COC to implement um, it. It's a little unclear to me how much we'll continue with this verified piece. I mean, for now, it's, it's central. And we actually uh, use the verified network from power runtime uh, in our controller. I think over time, as people start extending things and working on it, different runtime systems or different language extensions, um, I don't expect everyone to always you know, accept that 10x or more slowdown and prove everything correct. Um, so over time, we may you know, just move to another verified system. Or to Certainly not. I mean, the, the trick is to come up with a way to be partially verified. Yeah, yeah so um, one nice thing about the system is you can actually use components. So you know, if you want to call the compiler um, write your own unverified runtime, you can totally do that. So, uh, uh, 
I'm curious to know that the other very very efficient projects that you mentioned, like the CL4, etc. Could we actually go to the extent of verifying uh, not just the high level program, but also let's say the x86 code that was generated on the, even developing a specialized hardware and verifying that the hardware is actually doing the right thing. So what is the boundary of trust or uh, like verification that you Up to what platform we actually keep verifying in order to So all of these platforms make decisions, right? And I was actually a little imprecise when I described what Comster does. Um, so they use um, a technique that isn't actually verifying the compiler correct, as we have in sort of one step. They actually generate certificates for particular programs that show this output correctly implement this input. So that their compiler produces the certificate and they have a proof checker that checks does, is that is valid proof. Um, this makes it slightly easier to build various spaces of the compiler than sort of doing this once and for all. Um, so that's one difference is that you don't actually have this kind of static once and for all guarantee you get for particular programs, it was correct. And that's probably okay for a compiler. Um, in addition, you know, they don't, um, Compster stops at its model of x86. Okay. So it doesn't, you know, there are other people working on verifying different chips, but that's that's where they say we give you a correct x86 program. So the way the, the boundary where you stop here is that you're assuming that the open flow agent or something that's sitting on the switch. Oh yeah, totally. so so bogus switch. I mean, this is actually something that um, some of the payments work and some of the other tools address is that basically you could imagine detecting um, um, you know, bogus switch implementations. Um, so some of your test packet generation examples. Um, you know, there could be behaviors that are logically impossible, but of course the hardware does them bad, and so doubling back is sort of figuring out they shouldn't. Yeah. And we're not. Okay. I just want. Okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.